This is CBC Here and Now. Well, we're going to see a big jump in temperatures and then a big dip in the temperatures this weekend. The multi-million dollar cyclotron that Eastern Health installed almost three years ago is close to being fully operational. Coming up on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. We start tonight with a health update. The province has confirmed three new cases of COVID-19 today. This development brings the total number of active cases in Newfoundland and Labrador to 13. The number of cases in Grand Bank continues to climb, only up one though from four to five cases now. One of today's new cases, a woman in the Eastern Health region over 70 years of age. She too lives at Bluecrest Cottages in Grand Bank. She's been identified as a close contact of another resident there, also a woman over 70, who was reported on Wednesday. Now this week, there have been five cases of COVID-19 in Grand Bank. All are connected now to the other two new cases. A woman in the Western region has contracted COVID-19 and that woman is in her 40s. Public Health is still investigating how she con contracted that virus. And the third new case of the day is a man in his 20s. He's in the Eastern region of the province. Public Health says that case is travel related. He recently returned home from Nova Scotia and that man is now isolating and contact tracing is underway. Again, that's 13 active cases. Two of those people remain in hospital. Well, officials right across the country are pleading with Canadians to step up their fight against COVID-19. That's because Ottawa has released frightening new predictions about just how high and how fast case numbers could rise. Right now, every effort you make as an individual matters. Right now, about 5,000 new cases are reported in Canada every day. That could jump to 20,000 by the end of December if we stay on the current track. And if social bubbles expand and gatherings get bigger, officials say we could see a staggering 60,000 new cases a day by New Year's. The rate of active cases per 100,000 people is already pushing hospitals to their limits. Regions that looked to be in the clear months ago now have Canada's highest infection rates, including Nunavut, which had no cases just three weeks ago. Now, the Prime Minister spoke at length today. He acknowledged Canadians are getting tired of the restrictions and that normal Christmas gatherings are all but impossible. Still, he urged everyone to do their part to stop the spread. But here's the bottom line. We have a long winter ahead. As the weather drives us indoors, we really are in danger of seeing more transmission and far too many more deaths. It'll be tough, but we know what we have to do. Wear a mask, keep your distance, download the app and use it, avoid gatherings of all sizes, and know that together, being there for each other, we will get through this. to share this photo with you a beautiful shot this morning in St. John's it was a gray mainly in the afternoon you know temperatures have been sitting around the five six degree mark it's been feeling warm with that sunshine but today with those uh, cooler temperature or five degree temperatures and that rain and uh, it felt pretty chilly out there uh, feeling pretty cold across the board three degrees in corner broke minus five in Happy Valley Goose Bay this afternoon. We do have uh, lots of rain moving through. It's starting to end on the west coast Some flurries in the higher elevations that will continue to track further east as we head through the night tonight. You see those warmer temperatures to the south of us. That's what's headed our way as we head towards the weekend, but a big drop in those temperatures. Just take a look at the trend for St. John's back up to 11 degrees by the time Tuesday rolls around, but I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. RCMP and Hopedale are investigating a sudden death that happened in the Northern Labrador community yesterday. Police say a 37 year old man is dead and they haven't revealed any of the circumstances around his death, but police do say the chief medical examiner is now on the case. 
Well, a Happy Valley Goose Bay man, meanwhile, is facing drug trafficking and gun charges. Police pulled the 45-year-old over on Thursday afternoon, arrested him, and brought him into custody. And then yesterday, officers used a search warrant to get inside a house and vehicle. This is what their search turned up. Cocaine, cash, vehicles, firearms, ammunition, and drug paraphernalia that police say are all consistent with drug dealing. The accused appeared in court today. He's been released on a number of conditions. Well, it's been a long time coming, but Eastern Health says it will soon begin operating state-of-the-art equipment that promises to improve care for many patients. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. This is the Cyclotron. It's a multi-million dollar piece of a system that creates radio pharmaceuticals for diagnostic testing with this, a PET scanner that was also unveiled three years ago. It was lowered into a concrete bunker because it will soon be highly radioactive. In order to operate a cyclotron, Eastern Health needs a license from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission and approval from Health Canada. We have all that in place as of now. And that's why three years after these shots were taken, Eastern Health is still working towards producing a radioactive material called fluorodeoxyglucose, or FDG. It's something that's used in tests with a PET scanner, and Dr. Fleming says they're very close. It will take us some time to ramp up our um, supply from here until we're, f you know, we're not reliant at all anymore on outside FDG. It's a lot of work, but here's why it's being done. Anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of cancer patients will have their management altered by the use of this technology, which is a staggering number. I mean, it changes people from being surgically treated versus chemotherapy or one form of chemotherapy to another. So it's a, a definite uh, advantage and a significant change in how we manage these patients. Patients have been getting PET scans here for the last three years, but Eastern Health has had to ship FDG in from other parts of the country. We've had issues with transportation kind of at every point along that process. Problems that have directly affected cancer patients waiting for tests that have been delayed or cancelled. So there's no question that that has resulted in in cancellations and rebookings. Dr. Fleming expects those problems will be much less frequent when Eastern Health starts producing its own FDG sometime in 2021. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, NASDAQ's $3.6 billion acquisition of Verifin is especially good news for the place where the company got its start. 17 years ago, the company was born through entrepreneurship programs at Memorial University's Genesis Center. Well, NASDAQ says it's going to work closely with the university to increase scholarships and fellowships, as well as expand co-op programs to help grow the talent pool, as well as Verifin's employment base. They're also investing a million dollars in the Genesis Center, something that its CEO calls an inspiration for companies and entrepreneurs who are currently in their program. They now know that it can be done here. They can uh, attract the names of, of the likes of NASDAQ uh, from right here in Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, they can bring in deals as significant as Verifin's was yesterday. So huge boost of confidence for every entrepreneur in this ecosystem. And we'll have more on this story in about 20 minutes. A program designed to help take the sting out of home renovation costs has had so much interest it's getting a top up. Government calls its home rebate program a success. It supports various projects while also stimulating the economy. Cease Hair reports. Announced in June, the $30 million program saw 12,000 applications. Half showed up days before the August deadline, much more than expected. Under the program, people get a 25% rebate on what they spend on home renos, up to $10,000. It's for work on their main residence, and it covers a lot. Things like shingles, siding, sheds, additions, septic systems, kitchen and bathroom and basement renovations, too. The $10,000 cap also applies to new home construction. Because so many people came forward in the last couple of days of the program and because of, you know, we had to go through the process of pre-approval, mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure we had ample money there, so we've just increased the money available. And as By we get, oh, we, we don't know at this point, but okay. probably in the $34, $35 million range. 
Cody says currently there are 100 department employees processing the applications. Most pre-approvals are done and will be out in the mail soon. And for some who already have completed the work, payments have started. It's about 3,000 people who have submitted for rebate right. and, about, uh, and over 1,000 have received their rebate. So about one-third have received their rebate to, to date and two-thirds are in process. But they're in, good, in, in process to be provided a check in, in, as quickly as possible. Cody feels the program worked good for the economy while helping families. CSAIR, CBC News, St. John's. Many Dominion grocery stores in the province reopened today. They were closed for almost three months after 1,400 workers at 11 stores in the province went on strike at the end of August. The workers, represented by Unifor, were on the picket line for 12 weeks. Last week, the workers ratified their new four-year contract after what was called a final offer from Loblaw. The workers received an additional 35 cents an hour, increasing to $1.35 in year four of that contract. The new deal also included a signing bonus and 22 more full-time jobs. The workers went on strike after the company ended a $2 an hour increase for essential workers and because of the decision to reduce the number of full-time jobs. A little bit of an unsettled weekend as we head into next week watching our next big weather maker looks like some rain and wind for parts of the island and then some snow for Labrador. We'll have all those details coming up. Edmund Brophy of Daniels Harbor. He's a flying fisherman and so much more. The next of our archival specials, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Ashley's here now to look at the weather forecast. And I noticed last night how slippery the roads were, like the sheen, a bit you know, layer of black ice in a lot of places last night as I was driving home. It was because we saw that uh, quick shot of flurries and mm -hmm. then as we were all driving home yes it was a little bit slippery mm -hmm. uh i guess there's that you know period where we need to adjust once our it driving habits for yes. sure because <laughs> we're getting to that point now it's uh you know we're seeing these warm days and then cold days and then warm days and then cold days and uh that's generally what's going to continue yep good <laughs> unfortunately reminder. yeah that's right good reminder to adjust your uh, your habits there uh today was just a wet chilly day across the board five degrees in st john's uh seven in burgio same thing for marystown so that's where some of the warmer air was six in port of basque but uh those temperatures still well below zero up in labrador uh, minus five was the afternoon high in Makovic today. Now, I uh, showed you this earlier, but some of that warmer air down to the south of us is going to make its way uh, towards the island as we head through tomorrow, bringing some of that uh, warmer air with it. And as we head through the night tonight, the showers that are happening and flurries will uh, taper off for the most part over the evening hours. And are uh, going to stick around, though, unfortunately, for eastern portions of the island. And then another round of rain will make its way in as we head into the early morning hours. So here's a look at that. Some flurries will continue more than likely uh, along the northern peninsula, the coast of the northern peninsula. And then we've got some showers, uh, rather some flurries or light snow moving in for Labrador. There's a look at that rain that will move in again towards the early morning hours. Otherwise, it should be a fairly quiet night tonight. Temperatures will dip uh, into the single minus single or single digits. One degree in Corner Brook, light, generally light winds, 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. A little bit more breezy in the east with southwesterly somewhere between 20 to 40 kilometers per hour looking at a, a low near five degrees tonight for St. John's won't really move too much as far as that temperature goes minus eight in Lab City with those winds easing a little breezy up to the north though 20 to 40 kilometers per hour but generally looking at a pretty lovely uh, but chilly evening for southeastern portions of the Big Land. As we head through the day tomorrow, we'll be a little bit unsettled. We'll still see that potential for showers for the first half of the day. Northern Peninsula, some flurries, certainly in the higher elevations as well. And then uh, uh, in the higher elevations along the west coast, this will likely fall as flurries through the day tomorrow. 
We should see some peaks of sun as well through central if it clears out before the sun goes down uh, and then same thing for eastern areas as well. But you'll see uh, some snow, light snow will continue along the west coast. Then we get into somewhat of a snow squall, uh, potential for a snow squall setup anyway, Saturday night. Uh, along the west coast. So we could see uh, some accumulating snow with that. Otherwise, ridge of high pressure is going to move in, clear things out for Labrador. So it'll be a lovely end to the day tomorrow. Uh, as far as those temperatures go, like I said, we'll see a little bit of a warm up 9, 10 degrees for the Avalon. However, those winds will pick up out of the west 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. That chance of showers in the morning uh, in the early afternoon. Then we might see some clearing skies, few peaks of sun through uh, Gander possible as well. Kept it as as a, a mainly cloudy day, but you could see that eight degrees, uh, six in Twillingate, nine in Harbor Breton. And then as we head towards the coast, that's when things start to get a little bit more unsettled. Higher elevations because the temperatures in the upper atmosphere are a little cold. Higher elevations will likely see snow uh, tomorrow afternoon. Westerlies 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, but near the surface. You should see a warm uh, anywhere from six to eight degrees through the day. Cooler for the northern peninsula, though, and that potential for flurries will stick around two degrees in St. Anthony, zero in Mary's Harbor and uh, minus one in Cartwright. So areas in the southwestern uh, southeastern portion of the big land, you'll see those winds ramp up into the evening hours, 30 to 50 uh, kilometer per hour winds expected. That'll be the story along the coast tomorrow afternoon. You're looking at showers, uh, flurries. I keep wanting to say showers, but I mean flurries. Uh, minus three for Makovic, minus two for Happy Valley Goose Bay, and then Lab City, um, a few flurries possible for you, and then the sun peeking out as well around minus seven. As we get into Sunday, things will start to clear out. We'll start to see a ridge of high pressure move in, maybe some lingering flurries possible for the east, but overall, this ridge of high pressure is going to drop those temperatures quite significantly. So after a warm Saturday, Sunday uh, will take a dip. And then as we head into Monday, some more flurries will move in and light snow. This is the next big weather maker. Uh, it looks like winds will pick up Wednesday, uh, Monday night, and then we'll see a little bit of a break on Tuesday, mainly a rain event at this point for the island. But again, that snow, uh, which could be heavy at times up through portions of the big land and then those winds once that low moves north, those winds will wrap around again and we'll see uh, a big uh, pickup in those winds. Here's a look at Saturday's temperatures, uh, Sunday's temperatures rather, down into the uh, one to minus three degree range. Again, with that potential for a few flurries in the first half of the day, plenty of sunshine into the afternoon and then dipping into the minus single digits up through Labrador as well. By Monday, First half of the day staying pretty chilly, uh, zero to three degrees with that sunshine, but it will feel a little bit nicer. Uh, and then the flurries and light snow continues up through Labrador. So minus four for you in Lab City. And then as we head through the next couple of days into Monday, that's when that low will bring a push of warm air Monday night into Tuesday. Uh, it does look windy, like I said, 11 degrees at this point is what uh, I'm thinking for St. John's in Eastern Newfoundland. And then similar temperatures through central and western. And uh, after that, another big drop in those temperatures back down to the minus single digits. We might see a little bit of a push of warm air for Labrador uh, in the southeast, but otherwise you should stay on that cold end of that uh, low, bringing that snow and then staying cold right into Wednesday. It looks like we'll see a drop in those temperatures for Western Labrador back down to the minus double digits. Now I wanted to share this beautiful shot. Jim Blackmore shared this one of a little bit of a snow flurry there or a squall uh, over the ocean there captured by uh, from Cape Spear. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Thanks, Ashley. Well, today is World Children's Day, and it also marks a milestone for a local organization that offers support, resources, and connections to culturally diverse young people in this province. The group Sharing Our Cultures cut the ribbon on their new resource center today. We spoke with the founder and CEO, Loideta Cueco, about how this new space will enhance their services. Prior to this place, there hasn't been a place like it that they could come to. But it's important particularly for young people. They, if they don't have any friends, then their weekends are lonely. So it will be an opportunity for them to come here, opportunity for local people who may be traveling to some of these countries where these students are from and wanting some information. So we're hoping that it's not only going to be a learning center, it'll be a resource center as well. And the potential 
is limited. Is limited. <laughs> that the new home for sharing our cultures officially opened. They usually feel out of place and sometimes alienated in the classroom, especially if they couldn't understand what the teachers or their classmates are saying. So by coming to Sharing Our Cultures, they get an opportunity to meet other students who are probably facing the same challenges, but also they get to develop friendships with them. They have a place where they can interact and feel that others can understand them. They, sometimes they don't know that other students in schools uh, outside of their own school come from their country or even speak their language. So when they come to share in a culture, they find somebody speaking Arabic or Spanish, or, you know, so they just feel so much at home and it gives them that sense of place and belonging. One of the students who had participated in Sharing Our Cultures, oh, she said, Loideda, you saved my life. And I was really surprised, uh, you know, what she said. And then she explained that when she came, she didn't speak English and she didn't know anyone. She was uh, actually experiencing extreme loss of her extended family, her friends, uh, familiar places. And she said, I had to come to school every day. She said, I hated it and I hated my life. And she said, one day the guidance counselor said to me, why don't you go to the Share in Our Cultures program? She said, and I did. And I met other students who were struggling. I met people who spoke uh, my language. And he said, I just, it just saved my life. She said, I just felt so much accepted and at home and felt that I belonged in the group. And all of these students helped me to actually integrate into the school and and she stayed here actually and finished the school and and uh, before leaving for work to go to uh, another part of the uh, country children who have suffered um, violence and traumatic experiences is really hard because when they come here that's compounded with the fact that they have to learn a new language they have to start learning in a structure that is unfamiliar to them and they're here without knowing anyone in their school most times or not having anyone who speaks their language in their school. So it's very difficult for them and they go through uh, that extreme sense of unwanted isolation and sometimes they feel it's a rejection, so they feel that um, they, they, they don't belong and they don't know how they can actually uh, live and learn within an environment that is so unfamiliar to them. And of course they're still dealing with the fact that they've left family members behind. Some of them have watched members of their family, you know, killed and, and, uh, and they've had to leave and come here. And sometimes they feel a little bit of a survivor's guilt as well. So how come, you know, I was saved and the rest of the children in my school that was bombed uh, didn't. So it's very difficult and that's why we felt we needed a safe place for them where they could feel at home, where they can socialize and, 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 and their own level and in their own way and when they're ready sometimes they would express some of their concerns and some of the experiences that they had to go through and uh, we feel that it helps them to to talk about it when they're ready and to be able to empathize with them as well. The book of Genesis says it took seven days to create the world for Verifin and NASDAQ. That deal, it took 17 years, some major local impacts. We'll discuss that. That's next. Hey, it's Aoife. Farai. And Columbus. And we're three really, really good friends who really, really love to eat. Join us as we put our taste buds to the test and discover the amazing food around St. John's. We ordered the same dish at three places and then we vote for our favorite. Let's get stuffed! Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, last night we talked about that amazing $3.6 billion deal, which is the talk of the tech sector, not just here in Newfoundland, Labrador, but it made news in New York, Hong Kong, London. It is really big news. Today we're gonna to look more locally. This is really where it all started. Joining me are two guests, and we're gonna start with the president of Memorial University. So give me a sense of what this means for MUN. Well, what this means for MUN is that it highlights the value of MUN to the community and to the entrepreneurs in the province, because it was through Memorial that Averifin began. So, Michelle, uh, give me a sense of the beginnings of this, the, the genesis of it all. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Verifin started with us in 2003 uh, as a result of an alumnus from the university coming with uh, the idea and money. And uh, we worked with them for three years in our incubation program enterprise. Uh, we provided them with market um, 
intelligence services, with funding, with an advisory board program services, and a suite of other services. The founders of the company were actually already in the enterprise program uh, running another company before they started Verifin. Uh, it was an automation company for underground mining. How, how happy were you yesterday? I was very ecstatic yesterday. <laughs> Have you, For sure. Are you still thinking about it a lot today? Oh, definitely. The announcement yesterday of the acquisition of Verifin by NASDAQ was uh, perhaps the single largest uh, business event, business transaction for tech that has happened in our uh, province, perhaps even in our region of Atlantic Canada. What does this mean for the, se for the sector now as we, we sort of head to the future? Because my understanding is that NASDAQ actually gives Verifin really the keys to Europe and markets that it would be very difficult for Verifin to get to on its own. Yeah. And that's where the fit with NASDAQ comes in. What does this mean locally? It's huge locally. It means a significant expansion of our tech ecosystem. Uh, of course, NASDAQ is putting a million dollar uh, investment into Genesis, which is very exciting. Uh, it was very exciting to see NASDAQ, uh, you know, uh, in their news release yesterday mentioned Verifin. They are expanding the talent pipeline at Memorial University, and we're very excited about that as well. Uh, they, you know, Verifin themselves are ver very philanthropic. They will be. Um, and providing uh, and continuing to provide support to charities uh, and the community sector. So this is this is a uh, a deal I think that we will see a ripple ripple effect of for decades to come. All right. So your ripple is a million dollars, but there's also scholarships that will be significant to students, maybe the the, the Verifin entrepreneurs of the future. Maybe you could tell us a bit about the scholarship side of the announcement. So my understanding is that there is money for scholarships, money for expanded co-op programs, which is critical for our young people to have that work experience, work as they learn, and also money for my tax, which is an internship program. So all of those three together really help the university do what it does so very, very well, which is help students graduate work ready and entrepreneurially minded. How do you feel, and I guess I'll wind down the interview with this, how do you feel about the fact that we've had so much bad news. I mean, we're living in a pandemic. We had to get you to get your masks off before we started the interview. I got to stay six feet away with this fishing pole. We haven't had a lot of good news. How did you feel about the fact we actually have something to really to celebrate for a change? Well, there's so much to celebrate in this announcement. One, that it's so significant, and I'm going to say for Canada as a whole. Uh, two, that it shows the power of our young entrepreneurs in this country and in this province. And three, it also shows the value of a university and how a university is so important for the economic health of a province and of this country. So there's many, many good news stories in this. All right, Michelle, I'll give you the last word. Moving forward for the tech sector, what does this mean for future business here? Yesterday's announcement was a major boost of inspiration for the companies that are behind this wall here uh, and many of the other companies in our ecosystem. They now know that it can be done here. They can uh, attract the names of, of the likes of NASDAQ uh, from right here in Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, they can bring in deals as significant as Verifin's was yesterday. So huge boost of confidence for every entrepreneur in this ecosystem. All right. Well, listen, I hope that I get a chance to interview you both when the next big announcement comes. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, from one booming business to another, demand is growing for ultra-cold freezers capable of safely storing and protecting temperature-sensitive COVID-19 vaccines. A German manufacturer is stepping up production before hospitals and clinics around the world come knocking. The company says its freezers can chill contents to a numbing minus 90 degrees Celsius, even in places where the ambient temperature is 20 or 25 degrees. It also claims there should be a uh, if there should be a power failure their freezers insulation system will protect its contents for 24 hours of the two vaccines closest to distribution one needs a storage temperature of about minus 80 the other claims it can remain stable at standard refrigerator temperatures for 30 days Sometimes we don't get all of the haircut done, so we tend to do all the important stuff first, just in case the client decides that they're finished. Well, that's because for some, this process is too stimulating. How one hair salon has adapted for clients with autism. That's next. Hey, 
I'm Ram Raj Chavain, the co-host of the St. John's Morning Show. I want to let you know about a series we've been working on here at CBC NL. It's called NL in Color. I got a chance to sit down with folks that live right here in St. John's that don't always look and sound like the people around them. I'd be excited eating like mac and cheese and, <laughs> and fish and brews. The need to belong is less important to me. People are gonna think that brown people don't know what a crosswalk is. They think you come from, I don't know where. We've already given them so much, how can they ask for more? I was absolutely floored. You can tune in right here on Here and Now or on CBC Radio 1 or even online, cbc.ca slash NL. Well, for some people living with autism, the stimuli of everyday life can be really difficult to absorb or cope with. Simply going to a haircut and get to get a haircut rather can be a, a scary experience. Yeah, for sure. A St. John's Salon is trying to cater to those with different needs by offering sensory friendly haircuts. So what makes a haircut sensory friendly? We drop by the salon to find out. People are happy to have a space where there's no stress on them. They don't have to worry about other people being in the salon. Uh, they don't have to worry about disrupting um, a space because it's completely theirs. Hi, welcome. I turn off the music. Uh, we try and keep it clutter free except for the necessary tools. And I turn down the lighting. No background noise, no phones ringing, uh, no, no, no loud sounds, no surprises for the clients. You introduce it before you use it. A large number of our families have indicated that no matter what age their children are, getting haircuts can be challenging. The typical hair salon is loud, it's a little busy, there's different noises, there's different things happening. But through the offering of the Hair Factory, we've been able to offer our families the opportunity to get haircuts every Monday evening by appointment in this beautiful space that is quiet. There's one hair stylist, the parent caregiver can assist the person and really provide a meaningful, successful experience to the people. You can imagine yourself if every six to eight weeks you had to go through an experience that you found very challenging and then all of a sudden you came into an environment that was so supportive and so inclusive, how much anxiety relief that would be, not only for you as the person, but also as the family as a whole. Um, all the staff have taken part in autism awareness sessions and ASNL has attended a number of the first uh, haircuts to make sure everybody was comfortable. I've had a, a, young, a young boy and he's coming, in, he's coming in next week for his third visit. Uh, the first visit, he was just in to be introduced to the space, and his dad took pictures of me, and pictures of the salon, and pictures of the scissors, and pictures of the clippers to introduce him, and then he went. We weren't, we weren't doing anything at that day, and then he came back. This is a social story, and it's, um, you know, time for a haircut, so it just introduces the child to the space and to the steps and we'll encourage them to touch things, you know, the clippers and the water bottles and towels and everything that's needed along the way. So if this was um, done beforehand, then they would know exactly what would happen when they were here. It is unbelievable the number of tears, happy tears that happen in this room. I know uh, within the first month of hosting this, there was a young man who hadn't had his hair cut in years and he had very long hair and if, upon coming in, he was very anxious but they were able to, to trim his hair right down, get him nice and freshened up, and now he regularly attends. And so even that part, when you think about getting a job, being independent, making friends, if your hair is untamed or if it, if it isn't uh, clean and clean cut, then that's a huge barrier to employment and to developing friendships. So what the stylists here do is really they're breaking down barriers. For our younger families, it reduces that anxiety in the parents so much, and they're so proud their children are able to get really cool, stylish haircuts in a way that's supporting their needs. And it also makes them more successful in new environments. Because they have a successful, supportive environment here, their ability to bring that success and to build that confidence into a new environment, just it, it multiplies. It's amazing. One of the other things that the Hair Factory created uh, was the Hair Factory, Hair Factory Family Fund. 
So what that enables us to do is break down barriers for families accessing services. There is a long wait list for services such as speech language pathology, occupational therapy, um, accessing a therapist and counseling. However, there are private services that are, are able to be accessed, but those cost money. So the Hair Factory Fund is in place to, to knock down those barriers. So we are able to support families in accessing those services if they need them. Um, and through using that fund. So it is actually making a long-lasting impact on the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Okay, now to a story in another part of the country that you have to see to believe. For years, Jim Blackwood was feeding raccoons in his backyard in Pictou, Nova Scotia. Yes, and during the pandemic, videos of his furry dinner guests have gone viral. Colleen Jones now with the story of a raccoon whisperer. Invited to dinner at Jim Blackwood's house in the country. On the menu? Use, uh, these are chicken dogs. There's no salt or any additives in them. Turns out I'm not eating dinner, but the guests are starting to arrive for the feast. Come on. There you go. Okay, where are these fellas? Come here, you. Jim Blackwood is known as the raccoon whisperer. Every night, the raccoons oh, come, about 25 of them. Okay. You gonna come? There you go, for me. Someone made him this sign, Jim's Diner. Raccoons. It's a diner for raccoons, and Jim is the head chef. Where's Buddy at? He's named all the raccoons and somehow can tell them apart. Girl, here, Blackie, here. There you go. Jim was posting on YouTube for nine years. This was the first one, and yes, people watched, but he was hardly an internet sensation. He's gone viral now. This recent post has been viewed over 11 million times. You ready? His videos started taking off in the midst of the global pandemic.